Greetings and welcome back to Room 303, our 1010 Concurrent Enrollment Study, our study of St. Martin's Guide to Writing, the 12th edition. This is lecture number 12. We're going to be looking at part 3, chapters 13 through 16, writing strategies. Uh, this is really a brilliant review of so much of what you've been taught already through 303 and any number of sources. But I love the way that it's brought together in a very concise fashion. Uh, we're going to begin this lecture with the way we're going to end this lecture. Good writing is born of good reading. Good reading and good writing is understood to be intentional and not random. Okay? Now by that, as we go through this, we're going to begin in chapter 13 with cueing the reader as a, good, as a good writer. We're always attempting to engage in a dialogue. Uh, n not monologue, but rather dialogue. I mean, go back to our earlier study of uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail and think about the attempt at dialogue, not monologue, in a brilliantly constructed uh, essay like that. Now, by cueing, obviously, we mean signals. Signaling the reader. Um, and, and really, once you understand this is a strategy for writing, you'll pay closer attention to it as a reader to see how do good writers do it. That's obviously what we mean by good reading makes good writing. Let's just now work through it really quickly. These uh, different kinds of signals from thesis and forecasting statements, I'm on page 456, uh, to paragraphing, to cohesive uh, devices, to transitions and headings and subheadings. Let's go through them quickly. First of all, orienting statements are hypercritical. Our thesis statements have to announce main ideas. We call it the A to B paradigm, that is to say all academic is relational writing. Go back into those earlier chapters and every time we studied a possible thesis, notice there was always at least two blanks in any thesis, right, um, um, suggestion. Over on to page 457, we've got the forecasting of statements to preview topics. I'm not going into these in detail, so I'm just pointing, I'm, I'm hoping that you as a reader yourself will be paying attention to the examples that are given. Of course, paragraphing and paragraph indents are key in signaling related ideas. Topic sentences on 459 will announce the paragraph's focus. Obviously, announcing the topic is hypercritical, and the way we want to do that, obviously, is creative, but we always want to keep in mind our A to B paradigm, as we have said. The transitions are commented on the bottom of 459, and then, of course, the positioning of the topic sentence and body paragraphs. We're going to recommend in academic writing that most of the time it is that first sentence, although obviously it can be done elsewhere, right? You want to make sure, though, that your instructor knows exactly what it is that you're saying as you are writing, as we have pointed out before. On 462, the cohesive devices, they guide readers, helping them follow your train of thoughts, beginning with pronouns and the connection to phrases and sentences and word repetition, which will aid cohesion as well as synonyms on page 463. The repetition of sentence structure, we pointed this out so regularly in our study, for example, of what Francis Bacon was able to accomplish. Go back to our lectures on our studies and pay attention to the ways in which he's able, in the original essay writing, uh, um, to be able to play that game. And obviously the Trinity's studies um, serve for delight, for ornament, and for ability, the, that those three is obviously important. The, uh, on page 464, this is a, a, an idea that some of us are new to, the notion of collocation creating networking of meaning. The positioning of words together in expected ways around a particular topic occurs quite naturally to writers, and uh, uh, there, we're making some points of that there on 464. On 465, transitions, obviously to an, emphasize logical relationships on page 465, 466. Transitions to indicate sequence in time. Transitions to indicate relationships in space on 467. Finally, headings and subheadings are important. Um, providing the paragraphing, the indenting, signaling related ideas, topic sentences announcing paragraph focus, and then obviously headings that are common or not common in different types of genres on 469. Okay, Let's jump to chapter 14, narrating and describing. Narrating a basic strategy for representing action and events. There's all kinds of narrating strategies, like sequence uh, to sequence and dramatize events, right? The, the uh, calendar and the clock time is one. You have temporal transitions on 472. You have verb tense that you want to pay attention to on 473. Again, they give you a lot of great examples of this type of thing. The 475 action sequences, 
uses active verbs, not passive verbs. Put that in your notes, obviously an important one, right? Dialogue and the use of dialogue in narrative to dramatize events is important uh, and studied on 476. 478, we have the explanatory process narratives, obviously to relate particular experiences or elucidate processes followed by machines or organizations. 479, instructional process narratives uh, in the how-to, um, especially writing. We have description on 480, the naming uh, to give an overall impression as well as detailing to add specifics and convey thoughts, feelings, and judgments on 481. On 483, we've got the use of comparisons to make a description vivid and convey emotion. And what I love about Axelrod Cooper is they give you really good exemplars of each of these, and I'm hoping that you'll pay attention to them. On 484, we introduce the notion of using sensory description to convey what you saw, heard, smelled, felt, and tasted. Each of those from sight on 484 to sound on 485 to smell on 486 to touch on 487 and finally taste on 488. All of these can help you in your, in, in your description work. 489, finally, the use of description to create a dominant impression or a mood or an atmosphere. I mean, we think about the ways in which uh, great writers, right, immediately we think of James Joyce and maybe even Araby as a classic example of that. They give you lots of good examples there. Chapter 15, defining, classifying, comparing. You'll remember that it was Socrates Plato who argued before you can engage in true dialogue, we must define our terms, and here we're going to begin with the notion of defining on 490, the use of sentence definitions to explain terms and concepts briefly on 491, on 492, the use of extended definitions to convey the meaning of, co of complex concepts, and again, obviously, one can go back to any number of models for that, obviously. Um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail is a classic example of that. 494, the use of historical definitions to explain how a meaning has changed over time across cultures. The use on page 495 of stipulative definitions to reach an agreement on the meaning of a term or a concept. Or, or concept. We'll engage in classifying, in the discussion of classifying on 496, using topics and subtopics to organize classifications. And I just want to point out this diagram on 497 just as a, great, as a great exemplar of how this type of classification can happen. The use of graphics, obviously, to depict the classification scheme on 498, and then the cues to maintain clarity on 499 and coherence in a classification. Page 500, we're working with comparing and contrasting and the use of chunking or sequencing to organize comparisons and contrasts. And then on uh, to page 503, the use of analogies to make comp uh, comparisons clear and vivid, obviously, our study of Plato and Republic will help us in that regard. Go back and take a look at what we say about the cave allegory at LearnStrong.net as one, obviously, brilliant example of the analogy, the argument from analogy. Speaking of arguing, chapter 16, this is the last chapter of uh, part 3, arguing itself. This is all going to be reviewed, but let's pay close attention to it, the asserting of a thesis. Notice we have five different kinds of argument essays that we worked with in our part one of our Axelrod Cooper text. One, the assertion of an opinion, that was of course chapter six. Two, the assertion of policy, that was chapter seven and the proposing a solution. I'm just reading on page 505. Three, that was the assertion of evaluation, a chapter eight, justifying an evaluation. Four, this was the assertion of cause and causes and effects, arguing for causes and effects, chapter 9. And then finally, the assertion of story analysis in chapter 10. The key, of course, is to make, as we see on page 506, the arguable assertions in our arguable thesis, and then to use clear and precise wording on page 507 to qualify the thesis appropriately. And this is why we always talk about all arguable thesis writing as having that A to B paradigm. Of course, if you're going to have a thesis, an arguable thesis, you have to support it, what we call validated, giving reasons and support on page 508 and following, using representative examples for support, obviously, are, uh, are, are important, as well as on page 510, the using of up-to-date, relevant, and accurate statistics. Make a note for yourself, this is always a challenge. What do we qualify as up-to-date validation? 
Most of the time, if we're talking statistics, we want something within the last five years. We have the ability to do the research, and if we're using any kind of data that's beyond five years, we're always going to point that out in our, in our writing to say, now this data is a little bit old, it's not within the, the, the last five years, um, and, and obviously that's significant, at times even more significant than in others. Page 511, the citing of reputable authorities on relevant topics. How do we know it's reputable within the academic community? Community. Usually we qualify this as peer-reviewed kind of research. The use of vivid and relevant anecdotes on page 512. Sometimes writers will wander off into anecdotes that are not that relevant, and so we got to always ask, if I'm going to play that game of a rabbit trail of an anecdote, is it vivid, is it relevant? And then, of course, the textual evidence that we're, so we're providing in the form of internal validation on 513 needs to be relevant as well. And of course, as we've always said, anytime we're providing this information, we always set it up, set up the quote, provide the quote or the summary or the paraphr or paraphrasing, and then most significantly, we talk about why it's important after the facts. On to page 514, this will be no new news to you, the consideration of the, of the um, uh, uh, argumentative audience, the acrimonious audience, allows us to consider and respond to objections and obviously to alternatives. We have to acknowledge readers' concerns on page 515, and we will concede readers to readers' concerns at the bottom of 515. Of course, the classic example of this is Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. We've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net about that. Go back and take a look at that. Obviously, in the I Have a Dream speech of Martin Luther King Jr. and his letter from the Birmingham jail, King obviously learned well how to do this from his study of the Declaration of Independence. Every once in a while, people want to engage us in this debate about what text should be studied. Obviously, King knew Jefferson's Declaration of Independence well, and that's why he was able to concede so powerfully readers' concerns and yet make his own point even more powerful, we might say. Finally, over on to uh, page 516, the refutation of readers' objections has to be done with the appropriate, appropriate tone, if especially we want to create dialogue, not monologue. Finally, on 517, this identification of logical fallacies, we've been through these many times, obviously, in our compositional rhetoric study, but let's just remind ourselves for each one of these. Begging the question, arguing a claim that's true by repeating the claim in different words, sometimes called circular reasoning, we want to stay away, uh, away from this. Confusing chronology with causality, assuming that because one thing preceded another, the former caused the latter, also called, of course, the post hoc um, arguments as we've sometimes uh, pointed them out. The either or reasoning, assuming that there are only two sides to a question and representing yours as the only correct one, one of the major fallacies that will happen often in writing, and we obviously want to pay attention to this in our reading as well. Four, equivocating, misleading, or hedging with ambiguous word choices. Five, false analogy, assuming that because one thing resembles another, conclusions drawn from one also apply to the other. Our study of Plato and the Republic obviously has helped us there. Six, hasty generalizations, offering only weak or limited evidence to support a conclusion. Seven, over-reliance on authority, assuming that something is true simply because an expert says so, and ignoring evidence to the contrary. Eight, oversimplifying, we're often guilty of this, giving easy answers to complicated questions, often by appealing to emotions rather than logic. Nine, personal attack, demeaning the proponents of a claim instead of refuting their argument, ad hominem is, a, is what it's referred to as in the Latin um, for against the man, attacks. Ten, red herring, attempting to misdirect the discussion by raising an essentially unrelated point. Eleven, slanting, we know this all too well, selecting or emphasizing the evidence that supports your claim and, su and suppressing or playing down other evidence. Twelve, of course, the logical fallacy of slippery slope, pretending that one thing inevitably leads to another. Thirteen, sob stories, it's going to be referred to here, manipulating readers' emotions to lead them to draw and justify conclusions. And finally, the straw man, we're all familiar with the straw man versus the steel man arguments, directing the argument against a claim nobody actually makes or that everyone agrees is a very weak argument, is the straw man argument. Well, we'll end where we began with, with the discussion of part three. Good writing begins with good intentional reading. Let's become better at both of these activities within the academic community 
finally, of course, we'll be better thinkers because of it. Thank you.